the evolution of dual stream language models. So there are two types of uh, evolution that we could be talking about here. One is theoretical, uh, that is how have the ideas evolved, and the other is biological, how, how did the circuits themselves evolve. Um, we'll talk mostly about the first one, uh, but we'll use uh, the second one uh, towards the end and talk about it a bit. Um, so the usual starting point uh, for discussions of dual stream theory is the unger leiter mishkin uh, two visual systems hypothesis, which was proposed in the early 80s um, and involved a distinction between a uh, what versus where stream. Uh, the what stream was in the ventral uh, temporal regions and the where stream was in the dorsal parietal regions uh, involved in processing uh, respectively uh, what the object was uh, versus where it was in space. Um, <clears throat> in the late 90s, Joseph Rosschecker uh, proposed uh, similar what, where, division in auditory cortex. Um, and interspersed between these two uh, was a revised proposal, or a proposal to revise the two visual system model of Unger, Leiter, and Mishker, Mishkin, proposed by uh, Milner and Goodale. Um, uh, the what stream stayed the same, but the dorsal stream was reinterpreted as a vision for action stream, um, or a how stream, that is how to interact with uh, objects. And this was the direct ins inspiration for uh, the two speech streams proposal of um, myself and David Popple um, that was first proposed in 2000 and it developed uh, over the course of the next seven years or so. Uh, and basically it was a how versus what stream applied to speech. Uh, a few years later, um, Rosschecker and Scott uh, proposed a kind of um, synthesis of all these things. That is that there is a not only a how stream, but a where stream in uh, auditory uh, systems. Um, the what stream has kind of stayed constant throughout all this. No one doubts that pretty much. They further propose that the how stream is involved in uh, predictive feedback. That's uh, part of the mechanism uh, with respect to how it works, which is consistent with how stream um, research in visual motor control. Um, I want to point out that dual stream models for vision predate Unger, Leiter, and Mishkin. So we can go back to the 70s, and David Engel proposed two visual systems for the frog. Um, Gerald Schneider also proposed the existence of two visual systems uh, in uh, the late 60s, also in the late 60s. Uh, Trevarthen proposed two mechanisms of vision in primates. Um, we can go back even farther to Hugo Munsterberg in 1889, who wrote, when we apperceive, that is, when we perceive the stimulus, uh, we, have, we have, as a rule, already started responding to it. Our motor apparatus does not wait for our conscious awareness, but does restlessly its duty, and our consciousness watches it and has no right to give it orders. So basically, he's proposing a distinction between a motor response, which is unconscious and early, and a conscious recognition of what the object is or what it is that is being perceived. Uh, in the auditory system, all, dual stream models also predate Rosschecker's proposal. Um, so Diana Deutsch and Philip Roll proposed separate what and where mechanisms in processing tone sequences. And uh, well before that, all of these, in fact, in 1926, Stephen Poljak um, suggested that the constituent parts of the central auditory system have mostly a double function, uh, namely to conduct the peripheral auditory sensations to the forebrain, on the one hand and on the other to establish a reflex path for the cochlear stimuli to the motor mechanisms of the brainstem. So he's proposing a motor path and a um, path to higher level forebrain circuits. But the point of what I want to say today is that uh, language um, was the original dual stream model. So way back in 1874, um, Carl Wernicke proposed his famous model uh, explaining the, the uh, organization of aphasia, uh, which is uh, depicted here um, in the form of a kind of classical house model. Wernicke, of course, drew this picture here on the right, um, uh, but described this kind of model, which Lichtheim then drew in, um, in a form that looks similar to this. So comprehension involves this pathway, production involves all the pathways, and repetition involves this pathway. And this is basically a what pathway, understanding what uh, is being heard, and this is a how pathway, how to reproduce the sounds that are being heard uh, with the vocal tract. 
How does how work uh, in uh, Wernicke's thinking? Um, he writes this, uh, speaking of uh, fluent uh, phasics. Um, aside from his deficient comprehension, the patient has aphasic manifestations in speaking because of the absence of the corrective function exercised unconsciously by, by the sound image. So he saw it as a corrective function, which is basically a precursor to a sensory feedback control uh, models that were developed. Um, and this was 150 years ago that Wernicke was already talking about this. Uh, the hickok popo model is essentially a modification of the original uh, Wernicke model. So all we really did is add a lexical interface uh, in between auditory and conceptual representations and an auditory motor interface in between auditory and motor representations. And this is uh, area SPT, which after we proposed uh, its existence in, uh, in 2000, um, grad students in my lab, Brad Buxbaum, and others uh, went searching for it, and we were able to identify it, named it SPT. So why is it that what and how are perpetually rediscovered? Well, the most reasonable hypothesis is that it's true, that it, this is how the system is organized, and so um, uh, it keeps getting rediscovered um, and reproposed. Um, more principled explanation, though, is that the distinct computational demands of recognizing what versus interacting with something motorically require different networks. So just to illustrate, um, a couple of objects like this um, may be interacted with using similar motor actions, um, but clearly there are very, very different semantics involved. So recognition and motor action toward the object um, Re requires different feature level processing. Um, but there have been objections to this dichotomy of uh, what versus where stream, both in vision and uh, in um, audition and speech. Um, so for example, people point out that the streams interact um, as the picture here uh, uh, depicts. Um, even though we might reach for and grasp these two objects in the same way, um, our conceptual system, our ability to understand what it is, is going to drive whether we want to interact it, with it in the first place. So dichotomizing these things obscures the dynamics. Um, we know that production involves sensory systems, and people are quick to point out that perception also seems to involve motor systems. We'll address this a little bit later. And in general, it's just one big dynamic network. It doesn't make sense to, to, to talk about different streams. Um, the idea that we might get rid of uh, the dual stream model, I think, is a perspective confusion. Um, it, it's important to keep in mind that dual stream models are fundamentally perceptual models. That is, the people who propose them are vision scientists and auditory scientists and people who are interested at the time in primarily speech perception. Um, so the main point of these models is that there are two different systems that perceptual representations need to interface with. Um, on the one hand, it needs to interface with conceptual representations, and on the other hand, it needs to interface with motor systems. That's the point of the dual stream model, um, and this seems to be uh, incontrovertible. Um, so let's think about dual stream models from a different perspective. So first, this is the standard audiocentric perspective, and now we're focusing on the speech dual stream model. Uh, where we have uh, auditory cortex and some phonological level representation that on, again, one hand needs to interface with conceptual information via lexical access, and on the other hand needs to interface via with uh, motor planning systems uh, via some sensory motor transformation. But we can think about this network um, from a different perspective. So let's think about it from the perspective of speech production, say naming. So we're trying to name a picture, um, the classic psycholinguistic favorite, cat, picture, um, which we will, uh, will access some representation in, lex in conceptual memory. We will then access the lexical, abstract lexical form associated with this concept, and then access its phonological form, and then do some motor planning um, to produce the word. Notice that there's nothing dual stream about this other than auditory cortex kind of an, as an appendage off the side in this kind of model. Um, so from this perspective, the same dual stream uh, nodes in this network are working together to go from conceptual memory to motor planning. Um, conveniently, but not coincidentally, uh, this component of the network uh, 
uh, corresponds quite neatly to classic psycholinguistic models. So this is the Dell a connectionist model that has a, a semantic layer, that's conceptual memory, an intermediate word layer, and then a phonological layer, which corresponds to this part of um, the, um, the model here. Um, so the second point then is that given that this is the network, the engagement of sub-portions of it are going to be task dependent. And this is something that David Popple and I hit on hard at the beginning and continued pushing, um, and that is the idea that the neural system supporting speech perception vary as a function of task. And um, the scare quotes on speech perception here refer to the observation um, that we made um, that some speech perception tasks are tapping into what we then called ventral stream mechanisms, and other speech perception tasks seemed to be basically motor at least partly motor-related tasks in disguise. Um, again, uh, we were scooped by Wernicke on this idea. Wernicke also proposed that different language subnetworks are involved in different tasks. Um, and so comprehension involves this part of his network. Uh, repetition involves uh, this subset of the network. And production involves the whole thing. So uh, let's look at some data uh, and see whether this idea actually has panned out. Now, you're all familiar with functional imaging uh, data and observations that seem to suggest that pretty much all the areas are involved in all the tasks. Um, that is, you know, uh, kind of highlighted by uh, studies like this, where listening to speech clearly activates motor areas involved in speech production. We've seen that in our own work. Um, what I want to do uh, today is focus on um, chronic lesions uh, to inform us about causal involvement. Uh, so I'm going to describe a study that is currently under revision. Um, it involves over 100 left hemisphere damaged stroke patients, as well as some other uh, patients that we're not going to talk about here. Um, one task was a word comprehension task. This is a four alternative forced choice auditory word picture matching task with phonological and semantic foils. Um, it was presented as clear speech uh, as well as in noise. We also had a word and a non-word discrimination, same different task. The clear speech uh, result, a word picture matching, this is uh, the left hemisphere strokes. Um, uh, performance was basically at ceiling. This is a distribution plot of the number of patients at each uh, proportion correct level. And you can see that very few people, roughly 5% only, are down in this uh, lower uh, distribution. Um, which is not enough variance for lesion symptom mapping. However, speech and noise, the speech and noise task did produce the kind of uh, distribution that we need for lesion symptom mapping. And so we went ahead and did that mapping, and this is what the, the data look like. Um, so uh, basically, we get temporal lobe systems, no evidence of dorsal stream uh, involvement. Um, so left SGG, including auditory areas as well as phonological areas. Uh, as well as the left MTG, which we uh, consider to be the lexical interface. This is what uh, at least Hickok and Popple had proposed and others as well. So uh, comprehension does indeed seem to involve this sub-portion of the network and doesn't necessarily involve the motor part. Now, if we look at the discrimination tasks, so these were the sorts of tasks that uh, Popple and I were concerned about uh, with respect to involving um, uh, motor abilities uh, instead of the normal comprehension mechanism. And that, in fact, is what has been borne out in this large-scale study. So when we look at uh, discrimination only, we see uh, lesions corresponding to these yellow areas, which uh, is moving up into the dorsal stream um, and is not involving these um, ventral lexical-related areas. Both discrimination and comprehension involve this uh, region here, which is consistent with the model, where the split point between the dorsal and ventral streams is uh, in uh, phonological networks. Um, so here you can get dissociations where a, a patient who has a deficit on discrimination may have damage to just these regions um, and still be able to comprehend speech perfectly fine. And, and we have provided additional evidence that this is uh, the case behaviorally in this sample. Um, so this is just a scatter plot. Uh, this is noisy word comprehension, proportion correct, and word discrimination using D prime. And you can see while there's some uh, weak relationship um, 
this is basically uncorrelated. In fact, you get uh, dissociations quite readily. Uh, read, uh, readily. So um, uh, let's look now at repetition. Um, several studies have found this. This is one of ours, uh, basically associating repetition ability, uh, in, this, in this case non-words, with the left superior temporal gyrus, that is auditory and phonological networks, as well as this left TPJ, or what we call SPT, the auditory motor interface. Uh, so uh, whereas comprehension involved this portion of the network, uh, repetition seems to involve this portion of the network. Um, and uh, now let's look at uh, production. Um, so um, we have used uh, a naming task to measure production. There's different ways you can measure production, of course, but a standard task is just a simple naming task. Um, and one difficulty, because naming is, is a multi-step process, it's often difficult to identify the subcomponents involved in naming. Um, and this will help us sort out the different uh, regions involved. So we have developed a multinomial processing tree to estimate um, abilities associated with these subcomponents. And basically what this involves is uh, taking a, um, looking at the distribution of errors across this naming test and fitting it to this model to identify the latent variable sources of the different patterns of errors. Um, and then what we can do is use these uh, parameters uh, to estimating these different abilities and map them onto lesion locations. Um, this is unpublished work with Grant Walker, Julius Fredrickson, uh, involving 130 people with aphasia. Again, the uh, task is 175 item Philadelphia naming test, and we're looking at error distributions modeled with the MPT model. Um, and we, using this method, we can identify the semantic network. Um, so this is pretty classic ATL, posterior uh, temporal parietal junction, semantic network. We can identify a couple of different lexical level processes, including um, uh, kind of lemma level stuff, as well as lexical phonological networks, um, using some of the other lexical parameters. We actually have three different lexical parameters. Uh, and we can also identify sublexical phonological networks um, in uh, the dorsal stream. So uh, yeah, pretty much naming um, or, or speech production generally involves the entire network. Um, so Wernicke's prediction that there were different parts of the model, uh, of his model, would correspond to different brain regions and it would be task dependent is, according to this work, um, well supported, if not confirmed. So now I want to turn uh, to beyond uh, Wernicke and using the evolution of language uh, as a tool um, to think about the problem. Um, Wernicke's model, of course, is a sketch uh, of what we currently understand, uh, but the framework is essentially correct. And this is um, how I've uh, used um, evolutionary biology, or at least the perspective from evolutionary biology, to think about these problems. So here's the logic. Speech and language evolved in a large-brained, bipedal, tool-making hominin line with sophisticated motor control and cognitive ability. Um, what this means is that speech, if not language, and in another lecture we're going to talk about uh, language, will likely uh, exhibit computational and neuroarchitectural homologies to non-language systems. Okay, so that allows us to look to for example, uh, motor control in manual behavior as a model, a, hom a homologue to speech uh, abilities. And in fact, that was part of the inspiration for uh, the dual stream model as uh, Popple and I conceived it. Um, so we've started modeling the phonological network um, at, at, with a motor control architecture. And the basic idea here is that it's not just a layer of phonological nodes, it is an a set of sensory-based targets that code phonological level information that correspond to a set of motor uh, plans or high-level motor plans um, that aim when executed to hit those targets uh, mediated by a uh, auditory motor translation network. And this is a model that we came up with uh, using a motor control architecture, but this is basically the idea of this is the phonological system being fed by lexical and conceptual networks. We've also taken a standard psycholinguistic model and um, modified it. This is uh, the Dell model modified to, to exhibit or to mirror this kind of auditory, the separable auditory and motor phonological network. And we evaluated its performance relative to the typical model and found that it outperformed it. 
suggesting that the computation, this architecture is a valuable way of thinking about the phonological network. Um, and this idea has been extended um, in what I've called the hierarchical state feedback control model. <clears throat> so basically, this is just an elaboration of the model I just showed you. Its features are that it, it exhibits, uh, it has standard psycholinguistic levels. So here is the standard semantic, word level, and phonological level. But the phonological level is decomposed into a hierarchy of motor control-like um, neurocomputational circuits. So here is the auditory uh, motor circuit uh, mediated by SPT that I showed you before. This is a somatosensory circuit uh, mediated by the cerebellum connected to lower level motor programs. And this constellation here is what we uh, is the neural realization of what we call uh, phonology. So uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, this model, even though it is much more complicated than the classical Wernicke model, is in fact uh, just a, a filled-in version. Well, all I've done here is essentially augmented the classical Wernicke model. Of course, flipped it on its head. I put the conceptual system down here. But you can see this is basically concept, uh, auditor auditory on this side, motor on this side. We've added a lemma level. We've added some transform units. But basically, it's this same model. So Wernicke's sketch was essentially right. Um, and this is just a preview of where we can go what, once we have uh, the idea that, um, that there is a relation uh, between, a deep relation between psycholinguistic levels and motor control architectures. We can then start thinking about the relation between psycholinguistic levels, so things like phonetic level things, sublexical phonological, lexical phonological, lexical syntactic levels, and uh, the, re the same regions I I as identified in motor control oriented work, say the work of um, John Hood or Frank Gunther, where we can identify where a speech sound map is. So the vocabulary is different, auditory target and error maps and so on, but um, they're really just studying and identifying the same sorts of circuits, and this will lead us to an integrated um, kind of model. All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.